idea here was to really have uh, a conversation to kind of set the overarching um, themes of the day. So as you can see, Sir John is, is a, a really a global statesman. And I think I'm going to have to call you Sir Jedi John, because the, the knight order thing sounds almost Jedi-like. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. Just don't call me too late, that's all. <laughs> so, um, so Sir John, you know, many of the people here are working on essentially reinventing financial services. And I think that many of us who are working in this space like to think that we're building the financial institutions of the 21st century, and we're building um, ideas for financial inclusion or, or personal empowerment across the board. Um, but always this is done in the context of larger issues. And the, one of the reasons we wanted to have you in today was to talk a little bit about how do you see the world at large, especially with regard to the changes that are going on in globalization and, and trade. You're certainly an expert in this area, and we'd love to hear your initial thoughts on that. Do you have a half a day to discuss it? Yes. <laughs> well, Stan, first of all, let me say thank you for having that type of regard for me. As much as Kevin, thank you, Kevin, for the introduction, and you and your family and the rest of Bermuda have always been my friends. And I sit here today amongst friends. I think the whole world needs friendship. I think that's the problem that we have now is that everything gets compartmentalized uh, and uh, everybody defines their position not as friends and as people who want to uh, support each other but as adversaries. And you can see it on the news, you can see it in conversations, and the end result is there's always a defined position of you belong here and I belong there. And we see this in social issues, refugee issues, health issues. So when you ask me the question is what's going on in the world, uh, and, and what I see happening is it's not something that has not happened before. You go back to post-Second World War, just a short period, 100 years ago, you had countries like Germany, Russia, Germany under Adolf Hitler, Russia under Joseph Stalin, and Japan, which was the big force at the time under Hiroshima of Japan. And these were the tectonic players as much as today. You have the leader of China, you have the leader of the United States, and you have the leader of Russia basically doing the same things that were done then. So you have to put things in perspective. Except the difference between now and then is at that time, things moved at the speed of sound. 800 and roughly 70 miles an hour. It took, it took six or seven days for the photographs of the attack on Pearl Harbor to reach the media of the United States. As you know today, if it happens, you instantly see it. So we've gone from the speed of sound to the speed of light, 680 million miles an hour. And therefore the world geopolitics changed when we introduced that, and it was beginning of 1976, when some chap in, in, at Bell uh, invented the fiber optic cable. And we could then send information very, very fast. And as you know now, with Wi-Fi and the wiring of the world, everybody now has access to this. Everybody feels as though they can do their own thing as opposed to doing something that was done by the news media. And the end result is we now have a world in which there is so much information coming at us at such a fast rate and yet we, our DNA, our, our cranial processing, which we consider to be our brains, which we were born with, can't change as fast as things are changing. So we are now at a stage where we need to have an adaptation. If we don't get through that adaptation, we will end up really bumping so much up against each other that we will not be able to really define and redefine the new paradigm of where technology or where we need to be. And it's a question is, where do we need to be? Where do you, each individual and collectively need to be in order to bring order back to our system? As you know, the order of system has been changed. It's, 
it's been it's been redefined and redefined because no one knows exactly what to do. I was having a conversation earlier this, this morning, and I defined it as very simple. You have the computer, developed the desktop computer in 1984. It was presented to us uh, after, the, we, after we had the, um, the, the, the language by Bill Gates developed, very much like we had Vanta developing the language for DNA in more your contemporary times, and thus begun something of how we then, and that was done by programming. So programming became very important. It was the new paradigm of how we develop the, the implements that helped Einstein and others to produce the computer in, in order to get the appropriate calculation. And then with that and with the technology of the fiber optic, we went viral around the world. And that's your new order. The next stage, though, is now in front of us. We are born with a, with a DNA defined a brain. And then we have our own program. It's called the mind. The, the computer's fixed, and the mind is fixed. The brain. The computer's fixed and the brain is, is fixed. The mind and the program are the ones that are not fixed. They change according to conditions that we find ourselves in. The computer's been catching up with us because the brain has remained static, the computers remain static, but the programming has improved, and this is where you come into the picture, and our minds need to catch up because that is the programming for our, our brains. Now, if you understand that biology and that technology that are coming together, because what we have is the possibility of the, the brain and the mind coming together, the brain and the, I'm sorry, the brain and the computer uh, coming together, driven by the mind and the program. And there will be a, a, a when those two come together, We'll have a whole new paradigm. And, and why do I say that? Because when I hear about FinTech and blockchain, this is all part of the process of how we are redesigning the language we will speak, not necessarily the language in English, but the language in technology and the language in the future of the evolution that's taking place. And the problem with the politicians, the problem with people in industry is they are still going at a speed that the DNA of our, of, our, of, our, of our minds, of our brains, have programmed us to do. And this is the clash that's occurring. It happened philosophically, and that's why you had Karl Marx, and that's why you, have, you had Lenin, and you had these great philosophers trying to define the world at that particular time. So we've been through this before. And then we had a war called the Second World War. And all the things that we had in the, from the Industrial Revolution became the realities of what we did and how we evolved and so forth. So you're very fortunate because you're at the next phase of human evolution in how we order up our society. We're used to seeing train wrecks that's in slow motion. When we describe anything, it was like a train wreck in slow motion. Now we're talking about train wrecks in fast motion. And every country has it. Well, the Middle East is nothing but a big train wreck that's happening. And everybody's trying to wrap their minds around it. The problem they can't because each passion is speaking a different language. In the Bible, it talked about the, the Tower of Babel, everybody speaking a different language and therefore they can't get together to agree on anything. United States and its trade issues, United States and its, its, its foreign policy in terms of diplomacy and sanctions, they ex whoever has power, we're used to the power of the bullet and the bomb, and now we have to get used to the power of, of technology that will interdict into any system and change the order of that system. 
And because we can't see it, because we can't hear it, we assume it doesn't exist. And so are we, where are we now in, to, in the world? We're, we are at war because everybody has the same tools as it was with the bomb and the bullet as the Indians had the arrow and we had the guns, that's why we beat the Indians because we couldn't beat them unless we had, we weren't enough of us. But we had the guns and they had the bows and arrows. So the question is, in this new paradigm that's going to emerge, how do we get to a stage where we are now able to do what's necessary to redefine it? Why I like what Bermuda's doing and why Bermuda is in a, sitting in a preferred position, we've always played a role in the evolution of these new paradigms that have emerged. A small little island. And today, and today we are at that stage where we are re ready to play the next role. And you will help us to help the world to redefine itself because in this new technology where you're able to order and reorder and also understand and define what's taking place, these, these new technology implements are, the, are necessary. So you are at the Bill Gates stage right now. You know, people take Bill Gates stage for granted, but we didn't have a language for computers at that stage. We had computers. We didn't know what to do. We, we knew we were onto something. We knew we could have the technology to send messages, but we were just getting satellites in the air to take and make sure that we could do it by satellite, and we thought that was it. Then we, had, we, we were so used to the coaxial cable going across the Atlantic and taking a long time, and even trying to compress signals. But all that now is just taken for granted. It's just a new, it, we're now, so we're now talking about the next phase. And so this morning, I'm honored to be here because what I'm saying to you is think of the big paradigm. Think of the big possibilities. Think that you've got to move a lot faster. You can't sit around and have conference after conference and walk out of here and think, well, it's going to be OK. I can come back next year and get, that, get the message or deliver the message. It's going to move so fast, and it's not just moving fast in this part of the world. But when you go to China, 1.4 billion people, or you go to India, same population, out of that, you only need 100 people, 100 people who have ideas that are no different than whether you go back to the Carnegie's and the Mallons who had ideas about the railroads and how America would be formed. Or you go to the Rothschilds and, and see how the banking system would be formed in Europe. Or you go to the Bell in America and see how they just saw, I mean, they saw, uh, or, or Con Addison was the biggest example when they saw Tesla doing what he was doing. The poor bugger, he died broke. And be careful with your, what you do with your technology. He died broke because he was an ideas man. But he was not a doer. He was a creator and not a doer. And the end result was he created these things and a lot of other people made the money. He died broke. But he gave us from AC to DC, from DC to AC current. So I say to you this morning that define specifically what you want to do. Take and find the best knowledge that you can find. And I was talking to Jeff down here this morning, and I can tell you, that's the man you want to talk to right down there in that little purple, sh that little lavender shirt. Um, because his, he's, a, he's a global thinker. He's a big thinker. And he's helped Bermuda enormously to, to, um, to, to, to redefine itself. And we only have two industries at the moment. We have tourism, and we have insurance and reinsurance or financial services. So you're not talking about a country that has many, many industries, and you're just one of them. You'll be the next platform for Bermuda, which then will be able to offer itself to the rest of the world. So we beg you, join us, be a part of this dynamic thinking, and stand, you and your colleagues from different industries, we're so glad you're here because I think that we're on to a fantastic thing. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Sir John. Thank you. Uh, we really could spend half the day here talking about this. Um, and we do need to move on to the next thing, but I want to ask you just one more question real quick. Um, October 2019, it's, it's actually a big month. We're, we're heading towards Brexit um, in the UK. The US president is uh, up for impeachment. Um, the Chinese government is about to announce a, a national digital currency. The Russians have just launched an alternative to SWIFT and there are tariffs popping up everywhere. Can you give us just a couple minutes of your view on what that means? I give you one, one sentence what it means. It's a new norm. In other words, you know, we, it, 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 was, it was like we fought against North Korea about having the atomic bomb and it just got stronger and stronger with the time. You know, you fight against these things and all you do is end up making the provider, you use up your energy objecting, and they use their energy trying to improve that they're right. The world, nobody has a, a lock on anything anymore. That's the whole point I was trying to make and what I was trying to say. And uh, it doesn't surprise me. The United States now has reached a stage where it no longer will be the critical decider of things, and China's decided we can create a fiat currency system as United States and control it. And all of you don't believe in the fiat system anymore anyhow. It's just that you, you just grew up with it and your parents gave it to you, gave you some money until you go and use it. And you're used to having the credit card fiat system. Now what you're gonna have is, is, is the digital system. And China is saying, why, why don't we just stop trying to fight America and doing things that it did, or Europe, or, or and jump to the digital system. And, every, and at the end of the day, their, their economy is big enough to be able to take that lift and other countries will adopt to it because what you see happening in, in the Middle East and everything that happens has a re relation, re relative relationship. When you see what's going on with Ottawa and, and, and Turkey and, and Syria and, um, and Iran, uh, these countries, will have to decide whether they're gonna align themselves with the United States, and by United States now pulling out of that initiative, and the Syrians and the Turks getting together, uh, the Russians are already into Iran, into, um, Iran. So all they'll do is to simply, and, and Russia can produce a currency, Russia, Russia only has, and, and its biggest su supply of, 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 of um, natural, which is oil, gets sent by pipeline to China. So they have a natural alliance themselves there. So the, 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 the digital process is the overlay, overlaying, it's like the icing on the cake. And because we don't know what the cake is, all we know is the fact that the icing might taste good, but we can't see it. But all I can tell you is what's happening is it's so normal that we can't believe it. It's, it's so natural that, you know, it's, it's, it's so, People don't want to see change, but change is going to speed up. And what America was with its bombs and its threats and its currency controls are not going to run the world as they run the world. Because most people are going to say, so what? What are you going to do? You're going to blow me up? You're going to put sanctions on and stop me from eating? So I'll go somewhere else and get, I mean, look what's happening. The fires in, there's no coincidence, the fires in Brazil I'm not about fires in Brazil because Brazil wants to have fires in the Amazon. They never had fires in the Amazon before. They're having fires in the Amazons right now is because you know, when the United States cut off the soybean supply to, to or the, the, when they put the sanctions in and put in the tariffs, soybean supply costs got so high and, and they need so soybean. So what did they do? They're now burning those, those jungles down there in order to have planting land so they can produce more soybean. Indonesia says, if they're doing it and we're closer to China, why can't we do it? So they're burning the lungs of the earth in order to take and survive. We in the West think, oh, you're doing the wrong thing. You are burning the lungs that allow us to breathe and have clear air, even though we produce the carbon footprint. Uh, you should stop that 
and suffer while we continue to enjoy our luxury. So there is, there's a paradigm shift in, in thinking, and, um, and I'm not surprised. And, and, and blockchain, by the way, is very, very important because you know we've always done things in a very, very flat way. I mean, accountants do things, you know, the, just pure numbers, and they isolate everything in little boxes, little files. Now, when you can take all those boxes and files and have them so that you can have them as one process that allows you to see the bigger picture and allows you to integrate your whole system because things are moving so fast, you need that integrated system. That's the, the problem. And the United States Congress, we call it the United States, is still operating on a file system. They're still operating, going too slow because they think they're all powerful, but they're no longer all powerful. And, and I've had this conversation. I was at the, I was at the um, conservative conference. They invited me to come over to the conservative conference, give a speech. Two weeks ago, I was in, in Manchester. And um, my, 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 my speech was on modernizing conservatism. In other words, get out of the 19th century and come into the 21st century. Determine what is going on in your country and you'll find out that why Brexit is at a, a dead end is because you're still trying to do things the way they were done before because that's your traditional way and you're so wedded to each other. You know, I said, you know, you need a social conscience, you need to realize that the internet has produced the, the, the whole aspect of information. How do we get people now to use that? How do you use that? So I gave this speech and they've invited me now to go to Washington to give a similar type of speech uh, in December. So it's, it's a question of trying to, so, and the point I'm making is, I try to sort of not say what they want to hear, but say what they need to hear. Thank you for telling us what we need to hear. Sir John, everyone.